Welcome to episode 59 of the Sourcing Challenge Show. I'm your host, Mark Lundgren. In this episode, I sat down with Tiffany Balvey from Washington, D.C. in the U.S. and asked her how she got started in sourcing. How does anybody get into it? It's funny because, like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do in life, even though, like, that's not even what I did, but, like, had a real concept of what I wanted to do until, like, junior year in high school. And that was when I took my first anthropology class. And I fell in love with anthropology. I was like, study of man, like culture. And like, I was like, I just, I loved that concept. And so I went to school um, here in Northern Virginia at George Mason University um, in anthropology. And, and I, I started focusing more on the forensic anthropology side of the house. So, you know, crime scene identification and recovery of, of human bones and osteology and, and disease and bones and, um, really went down that path and graduated with that degree and then did some postgraduate work up in Pennsylvania at uh, Mercyhurst College around forensic anthropology and, and crime scene and graves. And so loved that. Um, and then everything whirlwinds got married and husband was in tech and there was no life of tech, you know, up in Erie, Pennsylvania, where I'd have to pursue my doctorate at that time. So, you know, I decided to stay local to DC Metro and, um, got a contract a friend of mine was doing contract recruiting and she was like it's really fun it's highly lucrative there's a lot of autonomy um you know some of the people that are around me are self-taught because it's nothing you can really go to school for mm -hmm. and she's like you know sit sit with me for a couple of weeks and i can kind of show you the ropes and we'll get you your first interview and see how it goes and you know i'm thankful to her we'll, we're still very close and she's still doing the contract recruiting sourcing thing um so she really she really taught me the ropes and I got my first contract gig uh, back in 2003 um, where I was an agency recruiter for like a government sponsored ent ent entity in like DC mm -hmm. Metro. So we were like doing like subcontract administrators, contract administrators, everything for the government. Um, and then was there for a couple of months and then Freddie Mac uh, reached out to me and they were looking to build out a sourcing engine mm -hmm. um, within, you know, their, their town acquisition group. And I had no idea what the difference was between a sourcer and a recruiter. Um, I didn't really even know like what sourcing was. And um, so when I went with them for the interview, they gave me this idea of like, okay, we need like candidate generation. We need competitive intel. We need somebody that has a pulse on the market. You need to be really good in data and analytics and, and trying to, you know, pursue certain directions based off of the data that you're, you're consuming and, and find a way to kind of put that in bite-sized chunks with, and work with recruiters and managers to, to kind of, um, you know, show them the lay of the land and where we should be going after talent. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, I'm a, I'm a data geek. Like, I love data. I love analyzing data and I love spreadsheets. And like, I was going to live in spreadsheets. Um, so I went to join Freddie Mac as like one of their first um, sourcers. And this was back in like 2006. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I fell in love with sourcing. Um, that was also at a time that I was kind of doing my own thing and just contracting myself out on different gigs to really figure out what industries do I really like? Um, you know, what type of roles do I get excitement around recruiting against? What type of teams do I like working with? Do I like to be like in a highly collaborative environment? Do I like to be on my own? Um, and then that's also when I got to try out doing more of like full life cycle recruiting, mm -hmm. sourcing, combination of the both. Um, and, through that, I did that for a couple of years at different, different companies, different roles is when I really realized like, I love tech, I love the tech industry, and I love sourcing. Um, and through that experience, eventually I got to the point where I was able to lead and manage and build teams. And then the combination of those three brings me to where I am now. And it's just like the best of the best. Like that's, I've been able to kind of, you know, take bites along the way to really figure out like, what is it that makes me, me go? Kind of early for you, and where did you go to learn, or what did you read, or you know, where did you kind of get that knowledge uh, and and hone in on those skills? Yeah, a lot of it was was self taught. I, I really had, especially at Freddie Mac, they had no practical knowledge of what that looked like in their team. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was building out templates, and I was building out outreach templates. I was building out searches and like even having to at that time, like LinkedIn was still fairly new, and it was a blocked site. Uh, they considered it to be social networking and it was like the days of like i don't even know what was that like friendster or i don't even know what those 
uh, <laughs> those sites were, but like, like, yeah, social networking. So I had to go through the ranks of even getting that unlocked so we could start leveraging that. Um, a lot of it was self-taught. It was going out on the web and searching, um, you know, hearing about bullying and not really knowing what it was and, mm -hmm. and searching and finding people that put out like their own bullying 101 presentations on PowerPoint. Um, and just kind of going through those and, and playing around with strings. Um, you know, like I said, Freddie Mac, I was really the only sourcer, so I didn't really have people to bounce ideas off of. So it really had to me go to the net and see what other people were doing or had done and try to make it work for myself and then just kind of iterate upon that and build that knowledge. The whole kind of DC metro area, I, I know has a you have a strong sourcing community, but it's very much kind of spread out. Like you either do government or federal work, or you do, you live there and you do something completely different. What's it, what's it kind of like in that area? Is it very much kind of split up on whether you do, you know, um, highly secure work or not? Or what's it kind yeah. of been for you as well, kind of having switched back and forth between that? You know, it's great to have the experience and have gone back and forth because it comes back to you somewhere or another. And so having worked in the cleared space and understanding that community and understanding how to source within that community gives me great experience that I can apply now because, you know, now in my current role, even though I've been removed from cleared for a while, it's kind of bringing that back in. It's like, hey, we're in cleared. How do we do this? We've never done it before. And it's like, ah, like light bulb, like I remember. DC is very much, like you said, it's very much you're either focused in, in government and federal sourcing and cleared, or you're in commercial. So that's like, those are like the really two populations we have here. And then aside from that as well, you have the typical, you're either agency or you're corporate. Yeah. Um, we don't have a lot here in DC Metro specific where you're either a sourcer or a recruiter. Mm. Right, it's, it's mostly a full life cycle community. We are starting to see pockets of sourcing teams come up now that like big tech is coming here. Yeah. So like now that Microsoft is here, Google, Apple's here, Capital One has built out a really strong team too. Now we're starting to see pockets of like actual full fledged sourcers, which is awesome because that is just something that's new within the last four or five years. And so with kind of SourceCon DC, building out that community and Ryan Gillis and the work he's doing, like that's been great to really see. Um, because up until then, you're trying to geek out with people on like searching and source strings and tools. And they're just like, we don't, we don't do that. Like we lived in LinkedIn or we live on Indeed and Inbound. And so it's great now to have that community. For people who haven't worked in the cleared space, but either now are going to or you know, they want to know what's that about or what to think about like what's the big differences from a kind of sourcing point of view what the what would you have to think about what would you have to change when when you start in that kind of area yeah the, the cleared space is is unique it's different and, and there's different levels of clearances mm -hmm. obviously yeah. so there's different levels of community as well like all the way up to the ic and the intel community and they have they have different cultures um, within each agency and, and each, um, you know, government role that you're supporting. So one big call out is that for the most part, it's really hard to search on clearances because people aren't really supposed to put their clearances on their LinkedIn profile or on their resume, but you know, people still do. Um, but for the most part, there's a lot of detective work that needs to happen in the forefront. Um, and again, that's like any sourcing, right? It, it's not like you build a string and you find a result and you're like, this is not what I'm looking for. And you move on and you spend five seconds on it. Like, no, like you still check out that profile. There's so much learning that you can get from a, mm -hmm. even a, what you consider a bad result or not a match for the role you're looking at, right? It's like, why did this populate in my results? Number one, like that'll teach me how can I tweak my string in the first part to like not have these types of roles show up. And number two, what is applicable here? What's mm -hmm. something that I can learn? Are there organizations? Are there companies? Are there roles? Are there locations? Are there keywords? Is there education? What's here that I can leverage moving forward? And so a lot of that translates into the cleared community because you're not able to search specifically for clearances for the most part, but you'll start to see common trends between locations. Mm -hmm. So you'll start to be able to affiliate a location like a Fort Meade and know exactly what government agencies are there and for the most part, what clearances people will have if they're at that location, yeah. right? So you start to get smart in, okay, how do I navigate around the whole lack of clearance on profiles thing? 
and what are some other key identifiers that I can find on a profile that will you know, kind of give me breadcrumb trails to let me know that this person is probably 98% of the match that I'm looking for and to reach out, right? That's a big part of it. Um, because some other, you know, sourcing, especially like even in big tech, a lot of it, you can be a junior sourcer and still do fairly well because a lot of it can be keyword driven or competitive companies or education and pedigree. Um, so this is nice because it kind of brings it up to another level and makes it that much more interesting and exciting. Um, but at the same part, on top of that, it's, it's a lot of community. It's a lot of networking. It's a lot of offline connections that need to be made and, and being present um, on site more than what you would expect in a, like a typical sourcing role. And you talked a little bit about tools and obviously not li living completely on LinkedIn. What's your kind of sourcing tool stack look like now? What is your team tool stack look like now? So I've been, um, and this has probably been from the very early days, I'm a purist. Um, like I just, I love all things Boolean. Like I love a good string. I, I love my team because I'm not as much hands-on sourcing now, um, but I have a team of sourcers and mm -hmm. a lot of them are very new to industry. So they're either new to sourcing in tech or they're new to sourcing in general. They've got maybe like one year of agency recruiting experience. And so this is really their first opportunity to learn how to source and source smart. Um, because our thing is like, it's work smarter, not harder, right? So like, how can we get you to get what you need in like the least amount of time? Um, so granted, yes, they're still, they're still living in LinkedIn Recruiter. We, mm -hmm. we get that. But it's how do they, how do they work smart in LinkedIn mm -hmm. Recruiter? Um, at the same time, we're in tech. So GitHub and, and sourcing on Git, you know, there's a lot of, you know, great extensions as well. And a lot of hacks to uncover mm -hmm. contact information on GitHub. Um, so leveraging that as well. We do a lot of diversity sourcing and, mm -hmm. and so for that twitter has been amazing and, and you know conference list hashtags and kind of following specific you know divcon um you know trends and those lists and those kind of like influencers um have been great it's fun that's definitely more of like the you know chasing someone down a rabbit hole um but if you have time for it and you enjoy that it's great to to get involved with that as well um aside from that uh, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing the data scrapers, so, or the web scrapers, they're using kind of like Outwit um, and different plugins for that as well. And for us, because we do have a, a pretty strong brand, we have a lot of inbound applications to yeah. our applicant tracking system that just don't get touched in the right time um, or don't get assessed very quickly. And so I've built out a team of talent sourcers that just all day long are scraping our applicant tracking system um, and they're qualifying talent that way. So there's even kind of just building out what's the right search within our applicant tracking system. How are we kind of, you know, getting through and kind of getting to the diamonds in the rough um, and what's a great way to automate that assessment process and the qualification yeah. process so we can get them mobilized and into our talent stream as quickly as possible. And what do you look for when you're looking for, for new people to join your team? That's a great question. Um, so my team right now is fairly, you know, junior to mid-career talent sourcers. I do have some senior sourcers, um, that I've either kind of kept because they really enjoy that hands-on sourcing piece. So they're either still like in a very full, you know, independent contributor role for talent sourcing, but just more deep dive kind mm -hmm. of niche roles. Um, and then I have those talent sources that are extremely skilled in tools and automation, but they want to lead teams. So yeah. now they're kind of leading teams as well. Something that, that goes across all of the hires that I look for um, is something that I call being generous with your genius. Um, for me, it's, it's highly collaborative. Like our environment, our, our team is very much team oriented and there's no, there's no I, right? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of knowledge sharing, there's a lot of competitive intel sharing, there's a lot of candidate sharing if it doesn't make sense for their particular role. Um, there's a lot of kind of like offline mentoring that happens, it's very organic. Um, and then obviously leveraging various tools that we have here that help us just kind of like crowdsource ideas, really have like a democratic approach to the way that we're moving. Um, and within my environment now, and with kind of the last couple of roles that I've held at previous companies, like scale, is of the major importance, right? So a team that is able to be agile and flex um, and is okay with ambiguity because mm -hmm. like our only constant is change. Yeah. We're always experimenting with something. We're always piloting something right now. So that real 
pure mindset of growth um, is, is key because failure is inevitable and you got to be okay with it. And you got to know that I'm okay with it. So I try to lay that culture as well. And, you know, through some of my, my discussions with candidates or potential new hires, like I understand, like there's definitely people that need that regimented structure that's very kind of rigid process approach. And then you have the people that are kind of like blue skies, innovating, want to try new things, want to experiment, okay with failing fast and course correcting. Um, and that's really the group that works well with me. And when somebody joins your team, what is, do you have a kind of structured learning? Uh, what, you know, what do you want them to focus on first? Or is there specific things that you're saying, this is the absolute basic that you need to have. And these are things that are nice to have. Yeah. For our onboarding, we have a, a fairly good structured approach to that. That's probably one of the only things we do have major structure around is the onboarding, <laughs> which I'm thankful for. And it's actually probably because I have somebody else that's leading it and building it, that there's actually structure. Um, so with onboarding, we have, what we do is we really allow like a, a two to three month ramp time period. Um, some hit the ground sooner than others and some take longer, which is fine, but that's really kind of like our target. Um, and so we start with the basics, no matter how many years of experience they have, they're, they're still going to get the basics because recruiting and sourcing where we recruit and source now is still going to be different and unique to other companies. Right. So we still start with kind of tech stack 101. This is what our current tech stack looks like at our company. Um, you know, these are ways to find the right talent. These are profiles that have historically done extremely well here. Understanding kind of like the org breakout of our of our organization engineering um, specifically and our process. Right. Like we have a huge global talent acquisition team here and specifically within engineering, we have a split desk and sourcing is about 40% of the total headcount for mm -hmm. talent acquisition and engineering. And within that 40%, we still have seven or eight different sourcing teams that, that qualify and deliver talent differently. And so it's understanding what each of those teams do, where they fit in that organization and how they can cross collaborate and work on making sure that the candidate has the best experience possible. That's really the foundation. And then beyond that, we have different modules to kind of get into our applicant tracking system mm -hmm. on a deeper level, to get into different tools on a deeper level. Um, my pet project over the last six months has been to build out some sort of kind of like sourcing kind of like a source con academy but internal a sourcing yeah. academy where we have these you know five minute online video tutorials that you know take on demand whenever you want them around how to leverage our tools mm -hmm. how to leverage other tools knowledge on different teams you know dark matter sourcing whatever it may be um to kind of whet their appetite depending on what their level is obviously with a with a big organization and big teams and, and that kind of split where is the split for for your teams like where does it where does it go from sourcing to recruitment and where's that kind of handover and how do you handle that yeah i laugh because um i'm on a weekly call with a bunch of like sourcing sourcing leaders like you know women sourcing leaders um on a, on a weekly basis and we've had this conversation before kind of like where's your handoff um and whenever I talk about my handoff, people are just kind of like flabbergasted because they're like, you're practically recruiters. And we're like, I know. <laughs> um, because the biggest team that I have, what we do is we build out these like monstrous interview finals days, like these interview events. And so we have a team that will go source and they'll qualify about 64 candidates for an event and they'll mm -hmm. bring them into our headquarters and they'll interview with different engineering teams that day. And then we have a debrief and then, you know, they walk away with an offer, no offer decision, usually within a day or two. Uh, and we do about 20 to 25 of these events a month. And our handoff is that offer. Uh, so if you think about it, yeah, we kind of are like really far along in the process, but for us, the data supports that. The data supports that that's the best place for a candidate experience to hand off is at offer stage. The town sources have worked so hard in cultivating that relationship and that rapport that they're doing everything from obviously like the candidate identification, they're conducting the screen and the assessment, they're walking them through the process, they're conducting kind of a, a prep call mm -hmm. before their interview day. They're contacting them like the day or the evening of their interviews to kind of see how things are going. And then they're making that warm introduction to the closer um, or the recruiter in this case that will actually walk them through the offer details. Um, and so that's, that's where our handoff has been. 
And I know there's a lot of controversy on, on that. There's other teams here that definitely do a much, you know, further left handoff that is kind of more indicative of like a true sourcer. Um, but I think, you know, it, it just makes sense for the way that our talent is, is delivered and consumed here for that. Oh, and as you say, if it's based on data and just saying like, this is what we can see best fits with what we have, then, you know, that's what it is. But yeah, I, I probably agree. That's like, sounds to me like, what is the recruiter doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I think they enjoy working with us so much, right? We're just basically handing them like a gift wrapped package. We're like, here's your candidate ready for offer. Here's all the offer details, their close points. Like, um, but you know, it, it works and it's very high volume. They have a good, you know, interview to offer conversion ratio. And so we're like, if it's not, if it's not broken, don't fix it. There's obviously still optimization opportunities mm -hmm. and ways to insert efficiencies into the process. And we're not 100% sold that this is, but um, for now, this is what's working well. So ask me a year from now, it could completely be different. <laughs> Who knows? And I'm fine and, with that. And for a sorcerer out there that's either they're further along in their career or they just, they kind of like what it sounds like that you're doing from a management point of view, what would be your advice to, uh, you know, a mid or senior sorcerer that says she would like to become a manager, uh, what would she have to kind of think about or what would you have to, to look at for yourself to, to kind of get to that point? Yeah, that's a great question. And I get asked that consistently, um, you know, internally and externally as well. And I have folks on my team that have come to me with that as well. And we're kind of walking through that. And so there's a few components to what I feel like really make um, a solid leader, whether you're in recruiting or sourcing or probably just in general um, and major like three components. And the first one for me, what I feel is extremely heavily weighted is data, the ability to leverage data and, and from the very early on point of knowing even what to collect, like what data is going to be important, know your audience, what data is important for them. And what, what should I be collecting if I'm not already collecting? What's the best mechanism of collecting it? And then once it has been collected, how do I retrieve that? And then how do I visualize that and draw insights from that to be able to tell a story and help drive business decisions, mm -hmm. right? So for me, data is key. If you're not already doing that as a talent sourcer, even as an individual contributor, there's so many ways that you can just do that, right? Like when I was an IC talent sourcer, like my big thing was to understand source of hire because I knew that there was budget decisions that were being made at the management level on which tools we kept and which we didn't. And as a sourcer, I wanted them to know from certain channels that we were already budgeting in or even some free ones, which ones were yielding the best hires for us, right? So even just tracking source of hire is a big key thing mm -hmm. that individual contributors can do. Uh, something that I used to also do as an IC is understanding quality of hire. And I know this is kind of like a big, like how do we assess quality of hire? Um, this was my approach and, and granted, you know, things can obviously change over the years, but what I wanted to understand was everything about the hires that I had influenced, um, and then also hires for that particular organization that I hadn't influenced and tracking them. And, and granted, like this will be like a two or three year plan to really understand, right? So understanding promotion and career trajectory for those hires. And then once I had kind of a year or two's worth of data, it was understanding, um, what are the trends? And so it was trying to understand trends, right? Like from those hires, was it was a common source of hire that we were seeing? Was it a common school or education um, major component that we were seeing? Were there interviewers that were involved in that process that were also kind of providing bright spots and areas of opportunity for us to replicate what they were doing? So that's at the IC level. That's mm -hmm. something that can be started now. If you're not already tracking data, that's very helpful. Aside from the data piece, it's presentation skills and communication skills. So that's something I'm trying to do now with my ICs that are looking to grow into like a lead or a manager role is bringing them into more conversations and discussions with leadership where they're developing presentations and they're leading that. Like I'm there in a support role. I'm there in case they get stuck on a question or just need affirmation on something. But I'm like, this is you, like, you know this and I'll work with you. We'll build the deck together. I'll show you how to find the data. Um, but you're going to be presenting this, like, you know this, you got this, right? So presentation skills, communication, verbal, um, written, whatever it may be, like brush up on those, do as much as you can. Um, and then the third is your ability to lead people through coaching, mm -hmm. um, right? So like really understand, like, what's my management style? And there's so many trainings out there as well. There's so many assist assessments, like DISC assessments and even Myers-Briggs, some of the old school ones, and a lot of free ones that you can take to understand what your style is. 
Um, but understanding what your style is and then understanding how you can modify that and coach people that might not necessarily be receptive to your style, but might still end up on your team nonetheless. Um, so kind of honing in on coaching abilities. And, and I think that's easier to do with mentors than it is to do on your own. Um, so finding a good mentor that's in a leadership role that can really help you and coach you. And then you can kind of take learnings from that and apply that. Tiffany, if people want to uh, well, stay in contact with you and see where, where your path takes you and, and your musings, how can they just do that? So I'm on Twitter, um, probably over the last three weeks since we've been quarantined, it's mostly been like workouts and pictures of chocolate chip banana bread my kids have made. But um, usually I'm trying to, you know, retweet or, or post nuggets um, of what I'm coming across or books that I'm reading that I find really applicable. Um, so Twitter, uh, my handle is at DC Recruit. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as well. Um, so first initial last name, T Balve, T B A L L V E. Uh, or you can just search me under Tiffany Balve, very unique name, and I'll pop up and very unique face. So <laughs> you'll know it's me. Um, probably still wearing the same scarf in my LinkedIn profile photo as I am right now. Um, and then, um, I mean, I'm active on Facebook. I, I love kind of just like digging through the SourceCon community posts. There's always something that I'm saving. Um, there's always something new that I'm learning. Um, and then if you're local to the DC area, there's also the, the We Recruit DC, uh -huh. uh, which is a local community for DC recruiters and sourcers as well. Thank you very much. I look forward to uh, yeah meeting you again when one, we get out and that we can uh, go to events again in the US. Yeah, looking forward to it, right. definitely. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, thanks, Mark. If you like this episode, please consider sharing it or any of the other episodes with a friend or a colleague who might be interested as well. And consider subscribing to the channel which will help us meet more people um, and grow the community.